Okay. Welcome everyone to our seventh and final Pub 101 meeting with the Open Education Network. We made it, we stuck with it, and I hope that this has been a worthwhile experience. I assume that it has been because you have returned each week and uh, that is much appreciated. So I'm going to start um, as I have many weeks before with looking back, contextualizing today's session, and then um, we'll spend some time today with Kevin Hawkins, who will talk about publishing and wrapping up um, publishing projects by actually publishing them in print. Okay. So uh, as I just mentioned, we'll reflect on where we started. We'll look at a few options for continued support. I will ask for your feedback about Pub 101, which I do really take seriously. I look at it very closely. And so please um, do let me know about your experience and then printing, sharing, and selling open textbooks with Kevin Hawkins. You may recall that at our first session together, we spent a little bit of time setting the scene. And we talked about how publishing is really integral to the promise of open educational practices because it invites more voices and perspectives into higher education, into the learning conversation, and means that we can localize and indigenize existing texts or create ones that are very specific to the classroom or the learning environment or community where we are located. We also uh, talked about how you can update text to reflect the current moment, especially when moments seem very fast and furious in contemporary society. And of course, that students can be invited and included in creating the content. So publishing is really an integral part to open education if um, there is the capacity and resources to do so, because it is also quite a bit of work. We also talked about how publishing can mean many different things. Uh, we see many euphemisms, many different verbs, many of which are listed here. And I think uh, one of sort of the common threads each week that we've gotten together is thinking about what publishing support may look like for you locally. It may mean uh, not offering publishing support at this time, but really thinking about um, what it could include rather than um, perhaps going out to faculty and saying, hey, we're here to support your publishing, knowing very specifically what you're in a position to do can be very helpful. Your time and your expertise is a huge deal. Um, and during Pub 101, we have reviewed sort of a programmatic buffet, if you will. And it's um, up to you to sort of pick and choose what may be um, best for you to do locally. I would now like to spend a moment with Pub 101 memories. Uh, this is looking back on our seven meetings. As a reminder, this is meant to be an orientation to publishing. We started with textbooks, our structured content. They're different than monographs or other publications in that each chapter is set up the same way so that student or reader has um, an expectation about how each chapter will be structured. We talked about accessibility, inclusion, and diversity at the start and how important it is to consider those issues at the start of a project rather than as some sort of remediation at the end. And we spent a lot of time anticipating what issues might come up during a project or building of a publishing program. And uh, as a result of that anticipation, we thought about how we might be able to build in parameters and call for proposals and MOUs working with authors strategically during the time that they're writing and as they're preparing to share and publish. And then today, as we actually talk about printing and celebrating a, a final product. So now I would like to ask you to take just one moment and share a memory you have from our seven weeks together. It can be something really serious related to uh, publishing OER, or it could just be something from um, our time together, something someone said, or a reminder. Um, please take a moment and put just a sentence or so in the chat.
Thank you, Amy. Anyone else have a memory? Perhaps Amy is our collective memory. Thank you, Rebecca. We don't have to do it all by ourselves. Yes, Jalen, I love that takeaway. There is a ton to know. I hope it hasn't been too overwhelming. The, try, the buffet, I'm trying to go with the buffet me metaphor. They're coming in fast and furious now. Publishing is a buffet, I can pick and choose. Thanks, Wade. Great, thank you everyone for, for sharing your memories. Keep them coming. I'm having a little um, difficulty with advancing slides, so sorry if it's a little bit awkward. Uh, as uh, you have said in the chat, one of the big takeaways is you're not alone. There are many communities who can help. There's Spark, there's Library Publishing Coalition, there's of course the Open Education Network. Um, there are lots of people to turn to who have maybe been that, down this path before, and if they haven't, they know someone who has. So um, please do lean on your communities. There are also many resources around, templates that can be modified. You don't necessarily have to build things from scratch. And as we heard, I think starting with Amanda Larson, who really set the theme for self-care, it's important you know, throughout the work that we do to remember we're asked to do a lot and it's okay to say no when we need to or to step away. And I think particularly with publishing, it's a very creative process. Sometimes emotions can run high, sometimes timelines can be condensed or um, expectations may not be met. And so I think in those situations, especially taking care of ourselves and reminding ourselves that we're doing the best we can is really helpful. Another quick word about ongoing support, specifically within the Open Education Network. Um, all of the resources that we have shared during Pub 101, they will live on. They're not going anywhere. So feel free to turn back to the orientation one-stop doc whenever you need it. Everything will be linked from there, including the slides and our video playlist. Same thing with class notes. As a reminder, you can find all the chat transcripts. If sometime in the future you're like, wasn't there something in chat? Wasn't there a link? You can find that in class notes along with the participant list. So if you wanna find a colleague or someone um, that is also listed there. More broadly, if you're not already an op Open Education Network member, uh, we are very happy to um, invite you and hopefully include you in future OEN community activities. You'll see our guiding principles, which are the common good, equity, inclusivity, action, humanity, integrity, and shared abundance. If you would like to learn more about that, it's on our website. And briefly, there are many benefits to becoming a member. There's a community of practice, there are workshop strategies. Many of you have said, I'm not sure that publishing is the right place for us to start when thinking about open education programs. We tend to agree. Um, and so we have many workshop strategies and other ideas for how you can support OER on your campus besides publishing. And that includes inviting your faculty to review a book that they find in the OTL, that is a member benefit. We also offer a data dashboard to manage the workshops and different programs. There's a publishing co-op, which I'll talk about a bit more in a moment. And Pressbooks has made uh, two different benefits available to OEN members, which include access to a sandbox and a 30% discount. So if any of these things uh, would be helpful to you, we hope that uh, you will reach out and um, I'll have more information on contact information, but you can also go to our website where there's a, a contact form there. The publishing co-op is simply a community of people who are working on or thinking about publishing open textbooks. I always say, you know, here's a list of the institutions. The institutions are the OEN members, but it's the people who are doing the work and the people who are, of course, supporting one another. And so um, our community asks questions, shares resources, and gets together once a month during tea time to have very informal and ephemeral conversations about the hard work involved in publishing. They're not recorded so that we can all sort of speak frankly. And um, they're a nice benefit, I think, of, of joining the co-op. So um, when we do the Pub 101 survey, uh, that will be an opportunity for you to let us know if you wanna join the co-op because you're already an OEN member, or if you would like to get more information about becoming an OEN member, which is uh, available 
to allied institutions, or excuse me, allied membership is available to institutions that are members of the OEM through their consortia at a discounted rate. Regardless of membership, but on the theme of community, we do offer a summit every summer and we have set the dates for June 14th through 18th. This is a totally free event. It is open to everyone. There are some members only events, but it's a great opportunity to connect again with the open education community, share stories, explore challenges in a collaborative environment. So I hope to see many of you again in June, if not before. Okay, I would now like to pause uh, and do a survey about your Pub 101 experience. I'm gonna put this link in the chat. And I ask, it's very brief, very short, um, but I ask that you please take a moment now and um, give me your thoughts. I will, Wait about three to five minutes. Once you finish with the survey, if you just want to drop a note in chat, uh, that will give me a cue that most of you are wrapping up with things. So let me know if you don't see the link or if you have any trouble. Otherwise, I will pause. Looks like a lot of you are wrapping up, so I'll just give it another minute. Thank you for letting me know in the chat. Keep it coming.
Okay, thank you for providing your feedback. If you're still working on it, thank you for your thoughtfulness. I will also follow up with a link uh, to this survey when I do our concluding email uh, as you have become accustomed to the day after our session. So without further ado, I would now like to introduce Kevin Hawkins. He is Assistant Dean Scholarly Communications at University of North Texas Libraries. Thanks for joining us today, Kevin, and over to you. Hey, thanks, Karen. I'm glad to be here. Let me start sharing my screen here. Great, so um, <clears throat> Karen invited me today to talk to you about sharing the open textbooks and other uh, open educational resources that you might create, um, especially in print. Um, because as you may well know, um, printing, um, print publishing has become more accessible in recent years with um, you know, technologies like um, print on demand. And, um, and you may even be familiar with things like um, ordering a photo book through Lulu. So um, it's become uh, ever more affordable to make things available in print. And, you know, while our open textbooks are always freely available to read online and openly licensed and all, um, many people are interested in there being a print format as well. So I want to talk to you a bit about some of the considerations uh, in making a print version available, um, because there are a number of things that you'll want to be thinking about in all of this and decisions that you would, would need to make here. <clears throat> so um, I wanna first kind of go over some terms um, from the printing industry. I don't wanna, of course, get in too, uh, too deep here, but I wanna use some terms that are gonna come up in our conversation and make sure we're all on the same page here. So uh, a print run is a um, set of copies of a book that's, that are printed all at once. Um, so traditionally a, a publisher when a new book comes out um, does an initial print run of however many hundred or thousands of copies. And you know once they get close to selling them out they do like a second print run and a third print run and such. And they are always gauging how many copies to bother printing um, because of course you don't wanna have um, many extra copies sitting around unsold here. And so besides the printer um, the, who, that actually manufactures the book, uh, another key player in all of this is a distributor. Um, so this would be the, um, you know, the organizations that are involved in, um, in selling copies of books, um, uh, uh, sometimes directly to customers, especially in the print-on-demand world, but often to wholesalers and, 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 and bookstores. Um, and so they uh, handle um, 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 actually, you know, collecting orders and payment and then fulfilling them by shipping copies out. And traditionally, a distributor is going to um, get copies to wholesalers and bookstores on consignment. So um, uh, they're made available. So a, a, a bookstore, for example, acquires a book on consignment uh, at a discount from the retail price. Uh, and then that's why the bookstore can make some money off of this. Uh, they're going to make the difference between the retail price and then this, this discount that they receive. But it's on consignment, meaning that the unsold inventory, um, they um, uh, can return it to the distributor and get all their money back um, for any copies they don't sell. This is how they can afford to have a big display in a conventional bookstore and not necessarily sell all copies. Um, or uh, there are times, especially with paperback books, when they actually don't ship all copies back. Instead, they end up um, uh, destroying them, um, but usually they like mail back just the covers to prove that they didn't uh, actually sell them. Um, but the point is they're going to um, get money back for any unsold inventory. So um, inventory gets you know, sent around in the, in the kind of whole ecosystem here um, uh, in this traditional model here. But um, in the world of digital printing, uh, things work a bit different. So um, rather than having actual printing presses uh, in the conventional sense, um, we can do printing kind of like your home laser printer, um, essentially, uh, and manufacture books this way, which means we can afford to do them at smaller quantities. And so it's, it's a short run, a very small print run, or prints on demand, one copy at a time. So you can replenish your inventory in small increments rather than having to do hundreds or thousands of copies at a time. You could do just you know, a dozen or two or maybe five or maybe one at a time. Um, so this facilitates the long tail of publishing audience, books for niche audiences. 
um, right, allows us, it makes it more economical to, to publish books that are only gonna have a small number of print copies sold. And this technology is available in the supply chain generally. Um, so publishers can use it directly um, or um, as I mentioned earlier with services like Lulu, there are ways that this can all be handled um, kind of direct to consumer. Um, so that um, uh, someone with a, with a book can set it up and make it available and consumers can order directly online. So one of the first things we need to think about if we're going to be making print demand versions of open textbooks is thinking a little bit about versions here. If you're using technology like press books, you can continually update a book. Um, and these tools often allow you to like instantly regenerate the PDF. Um, but the, the, the whole workflow around selling print versions is not set up to work with tools like this that, that are gonna like grab the very latest version at any point. So um, you're gonna need to have discrete versions of the book, like separate editions rather than allowing people to buy just whatever the latest version is that happens to be available through Pressbooks or another online tool here. Um, and it's probably a good thing anyway, because um, if you're making updates to a book as things go on, um, it gets hard for everyone involved to know exactly which version we're talking about here and to be make sure everyone's using the same book. So um, by having separate editions of a book, um, maybe one, a new edition every year or something, if you're continually updating uh, an open textbook. Um, it allows just everyone to be clear about what they're buying if they're getting a print version here. Um, you know, because again, readers are gonna expect that all copies of the particular edition are gonna be identical. So basically, if you're gonna make any changes to the text of a, of a book beyond fixing errata, like little typos or minor things, then you really should um, update the title page to clearly identify that you have a new edition of a book, right? Note this is second edition, third edition, or the 2021 edition, or whatever the case may be. Assign a new ISBN to that book. Um, so ISBN should be used uh, for every separate product. Um, so every separate edition of a book, also every separate format, hardcover, uh, paperback, large print, ebook, uh, audiobook, etc. And maybe you want to stop selling the old edition at that point um, so that no one would accidentally order it and be disappointed they're not getting the latest version of the book. I did put a question mark there because maybe you do want to continue selling it so that um, uh, instructors have the option to continue using an old edition so they don't have to adapt their syllabus and so that um, potentially there's some used copies available the students could get more affordably than buying a new copy. But there are a few other uh, kind of questions to be considering here if you're gonna be setting up a, a uh, sales of a print version of a textbook here. So are you, first question generally is, are, are you planning to sell the print books at cost, exactly what it costs to manufacture, uh, or are you aiming to generate revenue through these print version sales? Um, I mean, it may be at cost to the author or to the, the publishing program, um, not necessarily to the, the printer, right? And the distributor, of course, they're gonna take their cut. So if you sell at cost, there's no income tax implications. No one's making money off of this. No one's getting royalties. And so they don't have to report this as income on their taxes. And it doesn't raise any ethical implications um, or kind of ethical questions about profiting from the students, right? By making money off of them, buying copies of the book. Um, but if you are going to generate revenue, right, so if you're going to sell above cost, even if it's only, you know, a dollar or two per copy above cost, there's some questions you need to think about here. Uh, who's going to get the revenue or the royalties here, right? Is it going to go to the author or authors of the book, to the institution that's helped facilitate all of this, um, to, the, to the open textbook publishing program, or split between them in some way? Uh, is the money going to come into the institution centrally and then go to the authors um, because the institution is setting these up potentially? Um, so then are you going to have to account for all of that? Um, there's also some institutional policy questions here. If the institution owns the copyright because it was produced with institutional resources, um, does the author even have any right to the revenue? Um, they may not by institutional policy here. 
Uh, again, there's these kind of accounting and tax implications here about revenue coming in I mean, for the institution as well, uh, even though the institution has finance people who handle uh, accounting, um, uh, having income at a not-for-profit institution uh, raises a few issues and so they'll need to be handled appropriately. Uh, and there may also be policies at your institution about instructors assigning their own books uh, in their own courses and the potential conflict of interest there um, about um, them getting royalties from, from, from um, copies that the students in their own classes buy here. So some things to think about. Also, are you gonna um, produce a print run, one or more print runs, or are you gonna do this as print on demand only? So with a print run, you need an upfront investment. You're gonna have to pay to print a whole bunch of copies all at once. Um, but when you do that, the unit cost, what it costs to, to print each individual copy of the book is going to be um, lower than it would be with print on demand. You're gonna, you're gonna, it's gonna be cheaper to manufacture each individual copy. But you're going to need a way to store the unsold copies. And you're going to need to receive orders and payments and ship to customers wherever they are. Um, you don't necessarily have to agree to sell it worldwide, but you need to make that decision about which countries you're going to be willing to ship copies to here. You can, of course, can of course pay a distributor to handle all these things. Um, um, there are certainly um, plenty of book distributors out there. But um, you know they'll charge for that service, and they're going to charge to store uh, unsold copies. So the more you print up front, uh, the 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 cheaper, the lower the unit cost. So the cheaper it is per copy, but um, the more you're going to be stuck paying until those copies sell. On the other hand, with print on demand only, um, there is no upfront investment. You just get it set up, and then see how many copies are sold. Um, but each Unit costs more to produce, and so you have to sell it at a higher retail price in order to recover that. The print on demand operations generally have all the sort of fulfillment um, uh, services bundled in, so that's nice and easy and convenient. But um, if you are really intent on this book being available for bookstores to stock, that could be a problem because bookstores generally will not stock copies of print on demand books. Um, because they can't get that, um, that discounted rate um, from, from the distributors uh, and they can't re return unsold inventory because print on demand doesn't generally work that way. Does this matter? Like, are you really gonna have um, bookstore stocking a copy of this book? Well, the only bookstore you're probably concerned about is your own campus uh, bookstore, textbook store. And it might matter here because there may be financial aid and scholarships um, that are tied to the bookstore where the students have to buy their books through the campus bookstore. Um, your institution may also have a policy where you're only ever supposed to refer students to the campus bookstore um, to, to buy books. These sort of policies generally aren't enforced or aren't enforced strictly because it's impossible to, but in theory, um, at UNT, for example, faculty and others are not supposed to be directing students to buy copies of books from anywhere but the campus bookstore. Of course, students are welcome to, no one's gonna prevent them, but we can't be directing them elsewhere. So you're gonna need to work with the bookstore to make sure that they would be willing to uh, get copies. And they may not stock it, they may just order the copies if the students order copies, but something to work through. Finally, there are questions about um, color printing here. So sometimes um, you have authors who are interested in being able to print uh, the book in color because there are diagrams inside that use color, right? Um, so if you can do the interior in grayscale, um, that's much cheaper to print. And so it's a great way to go if at all possible. Um, with print on demand printing, it tends to be all or nothing for the interior. So you know, even if only a few pages are gonna actually be in color, you have to print the whole thing in color which makes the whole book much more expensive. And if you need photo quality paper, it's even more expensive. It starts to become just like impossible to do in, in, in print on demand at, at a cost effective rate. We also need to think a little bit about binding type here. <clears throat> um, so your covers are always in color. That's a good thing to know. But are we talking about hardcover binding here? Whether um, the sort of printed case or cloth, um, perhaps with a dust jacket, those are both much more expensive than paperback. Um, my brief summary I learned from experience is that you cannot print less than 500 copies at a time with a color interior and a hardcover binding and sell for a reasonable price, right? It just, you just can't do it. Um, it's just not gonna work out. 
And I mentioned before about this question of shipping overseas. Um, there are lots of options um, if you're willing to sell only to domestic customers. Um, so, you know, you can find plenty of options um, for printers that will ship domestically. But if you want to be shipping abroad, there's a bunch of extra complications here. You have to, of course, get through customs. Um, there's questions about whether mail and parcel services are actually reliable in shipping to certain countries. Um, distributors often are going to ship only with traceable shipping methods, um, which are more expensive. So it all gets much more expensive than you would find for the, like, the same book on Amazon or a similar book on Amazon. Um, Amazon will just ship the cheap way. And then if it gets lost, they just swallow the, the cost. But um, I found that distributors usually aren't willing to take that financial risk. Um, <clears throat> so you might need to work with one of the a larger vendor that has printing locations around the world if that's going to be important to you. Of course, keeping in mind that you may have online students in other countries, and so how important is it to be able to make sure that a print version is, is available for them to purchase as well. Um, in case you have a textbook where you're most interested in a print version, not for the domestic users, say the students at your own university, but for users in a country of the world with poor internet connectivity, perhaps it's a book about that particular region of the world, I would consider printing in that country uh, and making it available and distributing within that country rather than trying to do it from the US. Um, it may take some more work to set up such an arrangement with an overseas um, organization, but it's almost certainly gonna be easier than trying to have those copies all shipped uh, from, say, from the US. I do want to say, um, and I'm just about finished, we'll have plenty of time, I hope, for some question and discussion here, that um, there may be some distribution options at your own institution here, rather than having to work through third-party services. Uh, I mentioned Lulu, of course, before there are many others, Ingram Spark, um, Amazon's is called Kindle Direct Publishing. Um, there are some others out there. Um, your campus bookstore may have some options. Um, they may already be set up in some way to do something like uh, course packs, and so they may have an arrangement with some sort of essentially print on demand or, or short run service that can produce print versions. And if you have a university press at your campus, or if you're, um, say, at a state institution where there's a press that covers all state institutions in that state, um, you may be able to work with them on some of these things. They may be able to help make some of these arrangements here. Um, um, you know, because they have expertise in this and have some of these um, uh, contractual arrangements already set up with printers and distributors and such. Um, of course, they're gonna charge for it or they need to recover their staff time, but it still may save you overall in the big picture here. Another thing, of course, is that they may be willing to work directly with your authors. If you're willing to let the authors get all of the royalties uh, on any sales here, and you don't need to be in the middle, um, you as the person running the publishing program, um, maybe they can work directly with the authors on all of this. Um, the authors can like sign agreements with them or whatever, and you don't have to be in the middle and then they can handle accounting for royalties or whatever the case may be. Um, and really that's my recommendation more generally. Um, if the author owns the copyright and they're gonna receive all the revenue, that's the arrangement here. Um, let them set up something directly. There's no good reason for you to be in the middle. It just complicates everything. They can go directly to Amazon Kindle Direct Publishing, Ingram Spark, another or another one of these services. Um, just take the final, you know, PDF of the interior and the PDF of the cover, and um, set it up themselves directly. That to me seems quite a bit easier. So that's what I've got, and I am happy to um, to address questions you may have. Um, or kind of have a little bit of a discussion with you. Thanks very much, Kevin. So what questions do you have for Kevin about printing, publishing programs in general? Kevin is a wealth of knowledge. Um, or questions for one another. Um, I will start us off because I kept talking about this um, idea that you know it's so unusual in our professional lives now to come away with a book to hold in our hand. We saw Corinne last week. She had all these examples from Virginia Tech Publishing. She was holding them in our hand. She was showing us um, you know, pages on the inside. And, and for me, I feel like that's still rather special. And so with that specialness in mind, Kevin, I'm just wondering over the course of your career in supporting and developing publishing projects, how do you sort of mark this 
uh, final event, this uh, finish line, if you will, at the completion of a publishing project so that you can just take a moment and uh, live it up. Yeah, so um, um, publishers often arrange to have a, a kind of book launch event um, for an author, um, right, where uh, maybe the author's there signing copies, um, uh, maybe kind of promoting the book by talking about it or reading a portion of the book or something, if it's kind of creative, you know, creative writing of some sort. Um, and so that could be appropriate as well um, uh, for a book that you might be producing here. Um, so I've um, worked on some non-textbook projects where uh, we've arranged that sort of thing. Um, and so, um, you know, that kind of thing can certainly be nice. And then, um, you know, the author could set it up that like any sales on site, the, the royalties are going to go to, you know, their home department or the publishing program or something like that. So, um, and you can usually, I think you can usually get um, support, um, you know, outside support for such a thing, right? From the author's home department, for example, or their college, um, you know, for some refreshments or space rental or whatever the case may be. So those are certainly nice things to be able to do. Uh, it's a nice thing to be able to celebrate that occasion and market and all. So, um, so yeah, I, I think that's always a nice thing to be able to do. I see we have a question from Rebecca here, Rebecca Russell, um, as with the average cost to print a book and how do you set pricing? So it's really hard to talk about average cost because it, it depends so much on whether the interior is um, grayscale or color, whether we're doing um, um, paperback, hardcover uh, printing, whether we need glossy paper, um, to, and to a lesser extent on the trim size, what's the, the page size, right? The paper size here. So all these play in. And of course, whether we're doing print on demand, so we're talking about the cost for a single copy or whether we're doing a short run or many hundreds of copies at a time, really varies a lot. But if you do something like paperback printing with a black and white interior, you can usually get a pretty good unit cost even when doing print on demand, right? Something like, um, um, $5 a copy to print, right? For a sort of short um, or maybe even average size book, which means you could afford to do, sell it at a, at a retail price above that, comfortably above that, right? Say $9.95 or something, um, $15.95, whatever the case may be. But pricing really, I mean, it just depends on what your goals are here. Are you, is, are you, are you or the author trying to make revenue from the sales or are you just trying to sell it um, um, you know, just make a little bit of modest revenue or just really sell it exactly a cost and you just don't want to make any money and don't want to be bothered with all those implications. So I, it's really, you know, up to you. I mean, certainly people will sometimes think about what comparable books cost. So that's a starting point in this, like, well, I, I see similar books that are for sale and they cost, you know, $29.95, that kind of thing. So um, people often have those kind of targets in mind. Where this gets tricky is, you know, they're comparing to some book that is widely available, sold in bookstores, whatever the case may be, is not printed print on demand, but they want to do print on demand, right? They say, well, uh, you know, I don't want to pay up front for a whole bunch of copies to be sold, so I want to do print on demand. And then, you know, it costs a lot more to print, so they're not making quite as much money off of it. So at times it gets, these conversations get difficult because um, they want to sell at what they seem, think is a comparable price, but they're trying to do print on demand and it costs more per copy. And so they can't quite make the math work in the way they hope. Generally, though, uh, increments of $5 are common. Um, so ending in um, $4.95 or $9.95. Um, $95 rather than $99 because maybe pennies will go away. You don't have to remark the barcodes on all of your books. Thanks, Kevin. So we've focused a lot on the printing part of sharing. Can you talk a little bit more broadly about sharing digital copies and distribution and um, just other ideas for getting OER out there? Right, so um, in sort of conventional publishing, um, university presses and others, they are not just selling print copies, but also selling ebooks and so they allow customers to buy ebooks and they are making their books available on the kind of major platforms that you access books from um, that are say licensed to libraries right um, you know 
ProQuest eBook Central, um, Project Muse, JSTOR, or whatever. And so um, conventional publishers are kind of plugged into all of those workflows and know how to get their books out through these various channels. Um, those channels in general are not well set up for open access books um, because they're, well, I mean, if they're selling individual copies to consumers and they, they want to sell copies, and um, if you were trying to make a book um, freely available uh, electronically, they may not have a way for you to set the price to zero. Um, you may have to set it to like one cent or five cents or something, right? Uh, and of course, these library channels, again, are, are designed for content that is not meant to be, not openly licensed and meant to be widely distributed. So if you are trying to distribute electronic files and you want them to be as widely available as possible, right? You're not trying to make money off of the ebook files, which may not be the case. I'm just taking that as an assumption here, right? You're willing to make some money off of print because, well, it costs money to manufacture it. But for ebooks, you're just uh, opposed on principle. Then you'd be looking for other channels. Um, I think getting the books listed in a major directory, like the directory of open access books, is certainly a good way to go. Um, um, and of course the Open Textbook Network, so that the book is, is more widely discovered than simply a Google search that happens to lead people to your website where you happen to have this book. Um, these different directories have their own criteria for inclusion, and so they may be more or less appropriate for the kind of book you're doing. For example, the Directory of Open Access Books, uh, last I checked, um, requires that the books in it be peer-reviewed. And if you're producing an open textbook, you may not have arrange for peer review at your institution, so that book may not be eligible. So um, there's a bunch of issues there. I don't feel like I actually quite have a sort of clear path forward on that. <laughs> yeah, and, and hearing about all of the different channels that are used in traditional publishing reminds me of the channels that I see for the Open Textbook Library, which really uh, run the gamut. So if you do have an institutional repository, of course, that's a great place to um, store the files and the library will point to those files where they live in the IR. Um, but I also see uh, press books, obviously, uh, different um, bookmaking sites that also host the files, which can be true on a WordPress site or another um, blog or a website. I also see Google Drive. So we do point to things from the OTL uh, files that live in a drive. So it's very flexible and um, I think can, can work for the resources that you may have available at your institution. So I don't see any more questions in the chat, but that may just be because you're thinking about them. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll just uh, take another minute to see if any other questions pop up. They can be for Kevin and what he talked about today or other publishing questions in general that may be nagging at you as we wrap up Hub 101. Rebel would like to know if anyone has tried Staples or Office Depot print schedule for OER POD options. Hmm. I haven't heard of anyone rebel. Is there anyone in the group? Like a course packet distribution. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it wouldn't work. Yeah, um, that is almost certainly cheaper than even paperback um, print on demand because those kinds of services tend to use um, um, you know, just regular letter size paper and something like spiral binding that is, uh, my sense at least, is that it's cheaper than um, uh, sort of proper book manufacturing with the regular paperback binding or hardcover at least. Um, but I mean, well, uh, Teresa, I don't know. I'm speculating too. So, you know, uh, I'm not sure, but I, I think it would be. Um, you know, but it's it's certainly. I mean, it's gonna it's gonna look more amateur, but you know, when it's just for students in a particular class at one time, um, especially if the book is by their own faculty member, like it just might not be an issue, right? Why not print it on letter size paper, right? Um, certainly, when I'm planning print um, publishing projects with authors, sometimes they start with like saying, "Well, let's just you know do it on letter size paper," and my first thought is like. A book printed on a letter-sized paper looks 
amateur to me, um, right? Like books typically are manufactured with a different trim size that's not the same as letter size paper. So if you want this to look especially polished and professional, let's let's do six inches by nine inches or something that's more traditional. But again, if it's really, if it's course materials, it's the, you know, the latest edition derived from what's in press books um, right now, uh, and it's gonna change another year anyway, why not have something like a course back? Karen says POD is kind of a nagging problem for us. We're a large community college. We have our own print center, but it's for staff faculty support. Our bookstore doesn't really have this capacity. What have other campuses done successfully? Yeah, I don't know of anybody who has in-house print on demand operations. Um, there, there's this um, thing called the espresso book machine that some institutions have. Um, and like 10, 15 years ago, it was like, we thought maybe we should all set up one of these at our home institutions, but like, it just doesn't, I guess they're still around, but like it just, nobody could get this to work at scale in a way that was, you know, it's just like the major commercial operations, the providers can do this much more efficiently and ship you a copy. And it's just gonna be cheaper than trying to run this in house with your own machine. I'm just gonna put the, um, the module from our curriculum that relates to printing in the chat and then highlight um, printmeone.com, which uh, has been coming up more and more recently in open education circles as a great POD provider. They have set up specifically for OER, knowing that um, many people want to set the price to zero or at cost. And so that might be something to look at Karen as an option. And then it looks like um, some people may be chiming in here. Marilyn says, we've actually had students take a PDF to a local printing shop and have it done. And she doesn't think that it was probably very expensive. Wade says, our copy center has a service for printing OER. It's loose leaf with spiral binding. Demand has been low and Wade's at a small community college. Um, Heather says our duplicating service offered to print an open book for around $30, but again, not a lot of demand. So that is sort of always the interesting question. Um, you know, we, we have this urge to provide whatever students may need, whatever faculty may need, but we don't always have the best way of evaluating what it is that they need and the amount of effort that it takes to meet the need of maybe a very small number. So I appreciate what um, all of you are highlighting here in the chat, which is to maybe step back and see like, okay, for, for these students in this class, is this something uh, that there is a high demand for that would warrant kind of this sort of legwork, which I think is a, is a great question. Speaking of great questions, I think there is a chance that there are more great questions out there. So um, I invite them in the chat. If not, I will share concluding remarks. Heather, I'm not sure if this is a question. Are you asking about formatting for mobile output? Feel free to unmute if you want to clarify. Hi, guys. Um I just I know from talking to some students through e-learning that um, they don't always have a laptop or a desktop. So, you know, they might be taking an online course with an iPad. Uh, so having various outputs of your book would be helpful for those students, you know, if they're not going to print it, that is. Yeah, it's a great point. I agree. And it's one reason not to provide only a PDF version of a, of a textbook. Um, you know, a PDF, of course, is designed for printing. And on a laptop, we can all manage with the PDF viewer, but the smaller your device, the harder it gets to work with those. Um, and so having a, a version that has like a sort of web interface as well is, is really key here because it's quite true. The students will do lots of their coursework on other devices, look at things in passing on their phone even, you know. Um, only sit down to use their computer at certain dedicated times, um, or maybe they don't have one at all. So yes, all, all very good points there. Thanks, Heather. Okay, with that, I will say uh, thank you to Kevin. Please join me in thanking Kevin for 
sharing his experience and his time with us. And I will also thank all of you. Please feel free to um, say a few words to each other before we wrap our final Pub 101 meeting. Speaking for myself, it has been really nice to see sort of a consistent group of people week in and week out and have these conversations and get to know you just a little bit um, through, through the computer. I hope to have the opportunity to meet many of you someday in person in the future. And I hope that all of you um, are able to find a way forward in supporting open education in a way that works for you and your faculty and your students. I appreciate um, all the time that you've invested with us and wish you all of the best. So thanks very much, everyone, and hope our paths cross again. Farewell.